The witnesses of the first Easter saw evidence of Christ's resurrection, signs that made them believe. What if you would have been with them? What would you have seen? Are those clues lost to history? Or can we look back in time and find them? Would we find undeniable proof that Christ really rose from the dead? Perhaps if you saw the proof yourself, the signs of Easter, you too would believe it. And now, here is your host, Dr. David Jeremiah. If we were given the opportunity to travel back to the time of Christ, what would you choose to see? His birth in Bethlehem? His teaching and feeding of the multitudes? Well, for me, I would choose a front row seat at the tomb that held his body one moment and in the next was empty. Hello, I'm David Jeremiah, and welcome to Turning Point, and Happy Easter. That first Easter impacted mankind more than any other event in history. It is so vividly described by the Gospel writers that their words bristle with the excitement of seeing their risen Lord. But maybe you've never experienced that excitement. Maybe you question whether the resurrection even happened. Well, in a moment, we'll consider evidence I believe proves beyond a doubt that Jesus Christ rose from the dead as we discuss the seven signs of Easter on today's edition of Turning Point. Take the fastest journey through the Bible you will ever experience with Dr. Jeremiah's brand new Understanding the 66 Books of the Bible. 
Inside this beautiful hardcover volume, you'll find an inspirational overview of every one of the 66 books of the Bible, which includes a key thought, a key verse, a key action, and a key prayer for that particular book. Gain a fresh understanding of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation as Dr. Jeremiah leads you in understanding the 66 books of the Bible exclusively from Turning Point. Yours when you support this program with a gift of any amount. And if you do not have your own copy of the Jeremiah Study Bible and your gift of support totals $100 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will also send you a hardcover edition of the Jeremiah Study Bible packed with study content from Dr. Jeremiah including unique introductions for each book more than 8,000 study notes, hundreds of sidebars, charts, and maps, and more than 60 full-page life application articles, plus access to extensive online resources. Make the Word of God come alive. Contact Turning Point today. I'd like to ask you to join me today in a little experiment, if you will. I'd like for you to assume that you and I were privileged to be the first ones to go to the tomb on that first Easter day. And as we come toward the tomb, I want you to see what they saw, because the issue today is the resurrection, a creditable event that actually happened. Can it be supported by the evidence, and does history demonstrate that Jesus Christ did indeed rise from the dead. Well, if you had been with us on that first Sunday, if you had been with the women as you approached the tomb, you would have seen seven things both before you got there and after you left. The first thing that you would notice as you arrived there in the garden where the tomb was is that there were no soldiers. Now, if you knew what was going on, you would have known that soldiers had been stationed there to guard the tomb, at least for the first three days. You see, uh, Jesus had claimed that he was going to come back from the dead, and uh, the people who were putting him on the cross wanted to make sure that if his body was missing, nobody could say that he had pulled it off. So we read in Matthew 27 these words, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day so that his disciples won't come by night and steal him away and say to the people he has risen from the dead so that the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. When we arrive at the tomb that day, there are no soldiers. But soldiers had been sent to guard the tomb. A Roman guard unit consisted of 16 soldiers. The way it normally worked was that four of them would stand side by side in front of whatever it is they were guarding, and the other 12 would gather in a semicircle behind them facing inward. Every four hours, the soldiers who were standing in front of that which they guarded would take their place in the circle, and four fresh soldiers would stand and guard. And while the four were guarding, usually the other 12 were sleeping. It was a very formidable thought that 16 Roman soldiers were standing in front of the tomb to guard it, but when the women arrived that morning, there were no soldiers. Well, something happened. Something happened to explain their absence. Matthew 28, verse 11 says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. What had happened? The tomb was empty. Jesus was gone. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, and they said to them, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and they did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now, although the idea that the disciples stole the body of Jesus explains the missing body, the idea is more absurd than any of the other godless attempts to put down the resurrection and for at least two reasons. First of all, It is impossible that the soldiers would have all slept through the disciples moving the stone away from the mouth of the tomb and stealing the body of Jesus. In fact, 
12 of them could have been sleeping, but four of them were supposed to be awake. And the real kicker is this one. If the soldiers were all asleep, how did they know who stole the body? Hmm. So we notice when we come to the garden that day, there are no soldiers. As we get closer to the tomb itself, the stone is missing, but along with the missing stone is the missing seal. A seal over the tomb was like this. The stone was in place, and then they took a rope, and they stretched it across the stone and affixed it with wax to each side of the sepulcher. And then the Roman guard would put their signet ring in the wax, signaling that this was an officially closed sepulcher, that what was purported to be inside the tomb was in there. It was now closed and officially sealed. When they got close to the sepulcher, obviously the stone was gone, and so the seal was gone. And then, of course, the thing that must have startled them the most as they stood away from the sepulcher that day was that the stone that had been rolled in front of the tomb was missing. When they would seal a sepulcher in the days of Jesus, they did it like this. The, the, the body was placed inside the hewn out stone sepulcher, and then they got a piece of granite, and this was rolled in front of the mouth of the tomb to keep the animals from coming in and desecrating the corpse and to protect the dignity of the buried person. And the way they did it was they would cut a groove in front of the tomb, and they would get a stone, and they would roll it up the groove a little bit and put a shim under it. After the burial was finished, they would bring the stone back, and it would be there in front of the tomb. Then they would take the seal and put it across it, and this was the officially closed sepulcher. The Bible says, when the women came that day, verse 2 of chapter 28, behold, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. When they got to the garden that day, they noticed there was no stone in front of the sepulcher. In fact, the scripture is very explicit about what had happened. Mark tells us this was a stone that was extremely large, actually a stone which 20 men could not move. And so here was this opening, and there was nothing in front of it, and several studies have been done to determine how big a stone would have been needed to cover an opening four and a half to five feet, and the conservative estimates are that such a stone would have to weigh in at one and a half to two tons. Now watch, when the women got there that day, the stone was not in front of the opening, and it wasn't even in the groove that had been placed there to help them move the stone. John tells us, let me read to you what John says in the first verse of the 20th chapter of John. He says, the stone had been taken away from the tomb, and the words there mean to pick something up and carry it away. When the women got to the tomb that day, the stone wasn't near the opening of the, of the grave. It was off in a place by itself, as if somebody had just come and picked it up and moved it over, and then, of course, there was an angel sitting on top of it. That made an impression. Something was going on that day. The evidence is growing, and we still haven't come to the most powerful evidence of all. When they got to the tomb and they looked inside, the tomb was almost empty, but not quite. There was no body there, but there was a shroud there. When they got there, Peter went out, verse 3 of John chapter 20, and the other disciple who were going to the tomb and they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter, and he came to the tomb first, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. By the way, the other disciple is John who's writing this and always refers to himself in some oblique way. Oftentimes he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. How, how nice is that, you know? And anyway, when they looked into the grave that day, let me tell you what they saw. They saw that there was no body there, but the grave clothes were there. Now, they didn't bury people in a, in a kind of a robe. 
they buried people by, by winding them in layers of fabric, almost like you would think of as a mummy, putting, putting uh, spices in between each layer. So what they saw was, they saw the outline of Jesus' body in the grave clothes which had encased him. And as they looked to the place where his body was supposed to be, here were the grave clothes, still in the same shape as his body, slightly indented and caved in like the empty chrysalis of a caterpillar's cocoon. And that was enough to make a believer out of anybody. A glance at these grave clothes proved the reality of the resurrection so much that John went out from that experience along with his fellow disciples, and instead of being cowardly as they were before the crucifixion, they became flaming evangelists for the gospel. They were changed dramatically by what they saw that day when they went into the tomb and Jesus was gone, but his clothes were still there. Now we move past that first day and we begin to examine what happened in the days that followed. The Bible tells us that after the resurrection, there was an occasion when Jesus' apostles were gathered in the upper room and Thomas was not present with them at this particular time and Jesus appeared to them. The Bible says, he did not come through the door, he just appeared. Now remember, Jesus is in his resurrection body, and I don't want you to get spooked about this, but that's quite a body, the resurrection body, and it's the body we're gonna have someday, which makes it possible for you to be in a place without going through the doors. How about that for checking up on your kids? <laughs> I mean, Jesus was just there. That's what the scripture says. And Thomas wasn't there. And after the meeting, his, the disciples were all excited that they'd seen the risen Lord. And, and they told Thomas, we've seen Jesus. Actually, he came to a meeting and was with us. And Thomas says, I don't believe it. In fact, I'm not going to believe it. Unless I see it myself. Unless I see it myself, I won't believe it. Eight days later, John 20, 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came and the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be to you. And he said to Thomas, Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas knew it was the risen Lord because of the scars in the body of Jesus. And one last thing about the resurrection. Not only the scars, but did you know that after Jesus was resurrected from the grave, he didn't go right back to heaven. He spent a number of days still here on this earth, and during that time after his resurrection, we are told that he, was, that he revealed himself to many people, not only to the apostles, as we've mentioned in the two occasions in the upper room, but to individuals and to groups. In fact, if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he revealed himself on one occasion to over 500 people. He was seen by people in the morning and in the evening. He was seen by men and women, by adults and by children. In every situation you could imagine, Jesus Christ was seen. Now listen to this. And all the people that saw him were still alive when Paul wrote that there were 500 people who had seen them, and they could have certainly refuted that had they chosen. One writer has said that if you take all the witnesses who saw Jesus in his resurrected body and you brought them to court and gave each of them six minutes to talk, you would have over 50 hours of testimony to the risen Christ. So men and women, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ is alive, that he overcame the grave, that he was resurrected as the scripture tells us he was, and that he is living today at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He has overcome death. And here's where I hope you will listen carefully because if you don't get this part of it, the interest in the resurrected Christ will not be great in your life. But I want you to understand that because he is risen, he affects every part of your life. First of all, he affects your past. You see, Jesus came on this earth and for 30 years he lived a perfect life. And the Bible tells us that his purpose in coming was not to be ministered to but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Bible tells us that we are separated from God because he is holy and we are not. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
We can never measure up to his standard, and we cannot get to heaven in our own imperfection. And so Almighty God devised the plan of redemption, and that plan would be that he would send his only son, Jesus Christ, to this world, and that he would live a perfect life demonstrating uh, the reality of who he was, and that he would ultimately go to the cross and pay the penalty for your sin and mine in full so that we could be forgiven. And you may ask, how could one man do that? And the answer is, no one man could. But this man was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. He was not only infinite in his life, he was infinite in his death. And his death could, could equate to every one of us. And that means that the Bible is true, that Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin and for mine so that we could be forgiven. And so the best news about the resurrection is this, because Jesus Christ has come back from the grave demonstrating the reality of his words and the honesty of his statements, you and I can be forgiven of our sins. We can come to him and ask him to forgive us and know that he will do it. He's paid the penalty for our sin so that we can now come to God fully justified, not because of us, but because of him. When you get to heaven someday, perhaps it's going to go like this. Almighty God may ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? And what would you say? And if you don't have the right answer, that would be a bad time to be without the right answer. The right answer is this. You can only go to heaven through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself said that. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. You get to heaven by putting your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. And we know that is true because Jesus said he would come back from the grave and he did it, validating his veracity and his truthfulness. So your past is cared for. Most people are surprised that the resurrection has anything to do at all with your present. But the Bible tells us that because Jesus Christ died on the cross and was risen from the grave, that he now gives to you and to me the same power that was used to bring him back from the dead so that we can live our lives every day in resurrection power. The Bible says, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. How does that happen? By our trying harder? No, we've already been that route. It happens because Almighty God comes to live within us and fills us with the power of the resurrection. And then thirdly, not only does it help us with our past and with our present, but it's the guarantee of our future. You say, Pastor, can I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die? Absolutely. I'm going to tell you right now, I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Oh, you say, you're a pastor, you should get a freebie. No, no. <laughs> no, no. No, I don't go to heaven because of anything I've done. It would, be, it would be arrogant and preposterous for me to stand here and say to you that I know I'm going to heaven when I die if it were not for the fact that the reason I know that is not because of anything in me, but because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. Just as he came out of the grave victorious over death, one day you will do the same thing. He is the first fruits of those who slept, says the scripture. And that means that because he overcame death and we put our trust in him, he gives us the power to do that. And if Jesus Christ does not come back during our lifetime in the rapture, we're all going to die and go in the grave. But one day the Bible says the trumpet will sound and the voice of the archangel will be heard and the dead in Christ shall be raised. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, I am forgiven for all the things in the past that I have done and I'm no longer guilty before God. I have a new strength and power to live every day because the Lord God comes to live within me and help me be the person that down deep in my heart I really want to be. And I have an incredible hope that one day I'm gonna be with God forever. And it's not a hope so hope, it's a no so hope. And the same uniqueness that is in Jesus Christ is available to all of us to help us every day live a life that's very difficult for many of us now in the culture in which we find ourselves. With Almighty God in your heart, through Jesus Christ, you can do it. He is risen indeed, and the evidence for the resurrection is as compelling today as it was for those who encountered the risen Lord firsthand. God himself became man in the person of Jesus gave his life as payment for our sins, 
and conquered death itself. But the question is, how is that affecting your life today? It's my deepest hope that you've given Jesus Christ your past, that you're walking with him in the present, and that you're trusting him with your future. To help you build that kind of relationship with Christ, I want to send you two free resources that have helped so many around the world. A book called Your Greatest Turning Point and our monthly devotional magazine, Turning Points. They're both yours at no charge when you contact us here at Turning Point today. Gain a fresh understanding of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in Dr. Jeremiah's new Understanding the 66 Books of the Bible, exclusively from Turning Point. Inside this beautiful hardcover volume, you'll find an inspirational overview of every one of the 66 books of the Bible, which includes a key thought, a key verse, a key action, and a key prayer for that particular book yours for a gift of any amount. And if you do not have your own copy of the Jeremiah Study Bible and your gift of support totals $100 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will thank you for your generous gift by also sending you a hardcover edition of the Jeremiah Study Bible, quickly becoming a much-loved Bible for Bible students of all ages and experience. Make the Word of God come alive. Contact Turning Point today. Thank you for watching Turning Point. For a complete audio or video copy of today's message by Dr. Jeremiah, simply contact Turning Point today. Request Dr. Jeremiah's brand new Understanding the 66 Books of the Bible exclusively from Turning Point when you send a gift of any amount in support of this program. For a donation of $100 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will thank you for your generous gift by also sending you a hardcover copy of the Jeremiah Study Bible. You may also request your free copy of Turning Point's devotional magazine when you contact Turning Point today. In the U.S., write to P.O. Box 3838, San Diego, California, 92163. Next week on Turning Point, we should just keep on living for Him, keep on trusting Him, be aware of what's happening around us, know that we're approaching some very challenging days in the future. If this continues, it cannot be better for us. It can only be worse. But how many of you know that when you know Jesus Christ, opportunities like this come to us for us to be able to show the creative difference that Christ can make in our lives? This is Mark Larson. Thank you for being with us today. Join Dr. Jeremiah next week for his series, The Coming Economic Armageddon.